and are called according to his purposes in Christ Jesus. That's the way the passage reads if you want to look it up. Of course, I don't quote anything verbatim, but I, I try to get it right. I try to be honest about what I believe to be the highest translation of what I read. Because I, I know this much, that it's impossible to imagine a better God than the God that exists, than the God that ultimately, at the end of the day, rules everything, and he rules the affairs of men, even though it looks bleak sometimes. It doesn't look like that's the way it is. That's really the way it is. So we need to contend with some very powerful paradoxes. And one of those really powerful paradoxes is this idea that if you're a believer, like I am, and you don't, this doesn't require a lot of faith. I'm not a man of great faith, but I'm a man of logic and reason and science and math. I'm willing to just, let's, you know, work, let's talk this thing out. Let's, let's discuss it. So once you say, well, it does seem illogical to believe that, you know, all the, the eyeball, just, just take the eyeball, that this just, it was a quirk, just a fluke, it just, you know, it just evolved. I mean, why would it? You see, there's no reason behind it. Now, when you, you say, well, there's a brain, there's thought, there's imagination involved, there's design involved, then it starts making sense. Yeah, okay, there's got to be, because there's no way we have the state-of-the-art camera lenses we have today without having something to, you know, what do, what do we base it on? Well, they look at the human eyeball. How does it work? It's, 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 it's very intricate. It's, and there's all these little parts that are very integral to the proper functioning of the eyeball, right? We know that. And the same goes for a good state-of-the-art camera lens. So do you understand that a camera lens didn't create itself mindlessly? Okay, it just didn't evolve from some biological material and rock and dirt and water and crap. Okay, it, it was very thoughtfully done by a lot of engineers, very smart people. And so God is all those things in one. So you establish the fact you believe that there's a God. Okay, so the believers in God are to be the most joy-filled ones joyful. They're the ones that are supposed to be enjoying their lives the most and being attractive, setting a good example to the non-believers. Those that believe atheism, agnosticism, they just believe that, hey, don't bother thinking about it because uh, you're not going to exist and that's it. You know, once you die, you die and that's forever. That's, I mean, evidently because they don't want to discuss eternal life and all this sort of thing. Even though, you know, if you talk to anybody with uh, amputations, they all say, hey, they still feel that limb. I remember my, my dad, when he was building Fiddler's Green, he built this 48-foot uh, trimaran, six-bedroom, two-bath, sailboat, teak wheelhouse, beautiful yacht. He built in the town of Felton in the Santa Cruz Mountains back in uh, the early 1970s. And he had cut off on the bench saw, he um, had cut off his uh, left hand, his index finger, and almost lost his thumb. But uh, funny, st well, not funny, but he, he had bread. He owned a successful health food store there in Felton. And, uh, but, you know, you're not thinking, you're, you, he's had his fingers in a handkerchief. He's bleeding profusely. My nephew from Connecticut happened to be there. My not my cousin, his nephew, happened to be visiting at the time, Bill Murray, and um, Hart Lung, he liked to be called, quite the artist, very uh, eccentric fellow. He could have been a very famous artist, very, very good at what he did. Uh, but uh, he's one of those people that had, I think had an aversion to fame. But um, great guy. I always call him my favorite cousin. But he happened to be there. He was the only guy at the house at the time. At, um, oh, it was 288, uh, Ada, I think it was 288, 228 Ada Street. I still remember. Last time I lived there, I was 14 years old. A little two story house, big yard. I was able to build a boat, a little orchard. 
bought the house for like 17000 sold it for about 28000 and that house today is worth easily a cool half a million, easily. But um, not worth, but that's what it would cost you. But anyhow, he rushed him to the hospital, and uh, the Dominican, it was a Catholic-run hospital, holding his fingers, goes to the emergency room. And then they made him fill out all these insurance papers they didn't have, and you know, he couldn't qualify, and he couldn't prove his financial solvency and he had to wait there for 45 minutes and he finally ended up taking my, my cousin took him to the uh, Bill Murray took him to the uh, county hospital where they took care of him right away but um, they were able to save his, his uh, thumb but he uh, ended up losing his index finger on his left hand but he always said that he could feel it and uh, I've heard this from other amputees too that they still feel the limb. It's a ghost limb, they call it. So I believe the same is true by extension for the entire body. It's kind of like sleeping at night. You know, Jesus conflated uh, death with sleep and sleep with death. It's just comes some kind of a branch of sleep, deeper sleep, if you will. But if you ever notice and you remember any of your dreams, you know that you have a body in your dream. You have your five senses in your dream. So it's a very awesome thing, this idea that we are eternal beings. That this whole idea that we die in and of itself is alive from the pit of hell. I mean, can you imagine what good news that is when you really, really uh, embrace that idea and ruminate over it and, and just praise God and say, wow, that's great because this is... The worst fear any of us could ever have is this thing we call death. It's so ominous. It's so foreboding, and yet we all face it. I mean, you know, it's quite simple. Life, good. Death, bad. But death, you see, that word is it's evil. It's satanic. It came about because of this deception, the, the original sin, the fall of man, and the subsequent curse. All the negativity, all the negative organic suffering that we experience stems from this. And I don't complain about that stuff because it's across the board. But it explains everything. You see, atheists, too, have inquiring minds and they want to know. And so as believers, you've got to have something substantive, something they can sink their teeth into. So, says, okay, that's an anecdote. That's a story I can buy, perhaps. This idea that, okay, something went askew. And, you know, why would God tempt humanity? Why would he put this tree of knowledge of forbidden fruit this enticing tree and just tell us look don't eat from this particular tree anything else in the garden here that i've given you uh, it's so bountiful but don't eat of this one fruit you see it was all about giving us this power of free will choice we had the choice to listen to him or to listen to other voices and those other voices as the story goes was this this rebellious force okay whatever it was it was it was called the serpent but you see it's just that's just a um, a, a, um, a metaphor for whatever these forces were because i mean we think of one what well, one devil one serpent and you see but behind him was an army like it's written when lucifer was kicked out of heaven for being rebellious you see he didn't go alone he wasn't cast out and kicked out of heaven alone. He tried to fight for God, the throne of God. He wanted to exalt himself above God. He wanted to use this precious and powerful free will choice to literally um, hijack, usurp God's throne. And it, it, God wasn't having it. So the holy angels, good was more powerful. The light, the truth, the righteousness, the holiness was stronger and so God prevailed God and the holy angels prevailed and kicked Satan out kicked evil out kicked Lucifer out kicked death out kicked the liar out okay the father of lies the murderer from the beginning that was willing to murder God and the holy angels to get his way didn't care just wanted all that vast wanton power that God had over the universe and all the beings all the living creatures therein and God wasn't having it. And he kicked his butt out. He showed him what's what. And uh, we can all be very grateful to that. All the righteous can. But if you bent on being wicked, no. You're going to lament for a long time until you repent. 
you know, God has a way of getting the job done. He's always got a card up his sleeve. So he wins every game, hands down, at the end of the day. In the long run, ultimately, he'll win. And so he won, so Satan's not in this heaven, you see. And now we are down here on earth. Okay, and this is our story, very Shakespearean, this bittersweet existence. And there could be countless planets with very similar beings, with very similar stories. But you see, it's very important to understand that God had to give us this power. If we were going to be made in his image and likeness, we weren't just going to be instinctual automatons like all the other animals. All the other fauna out there was basically going by instinct. But we had this very unique trait this power to think, this imagination that was very much like God. You see, it's a huge departure from all the other creatures who go by sheer instinct. They can't develop technology. When was the last time you saw a monkey on their own? I mean, any group of monkeys, apes, dolphins, or anything else do what we humans have done. You see, we're very distinct. We're very special creatures. We are godlike creatures. We are extensions of God, children of God, therefore. And the planet is God's creation. He created it, and he gave it to us to use, to share, to subdue, and to take care of, to be good stewards of it, to not pollute it, to not destroy it. And so, so on one hand, we've got all these great reasons to be really happy and joyful. And understand this great gift that Jesus gave when he died on the cross, proving once and for all, okay, that it settled science. There is no death that God has control over it. Jesus raised the dead and proved it repeatedly that God has that power to raise the dead. His friend Lazarus, okay, four days he'd been dead. And people just, they told Jesus he was stupid. Okay, Lord, you, you know what? We're going to teach you that you just don't understand. I mean, we know you loved Lazarus, and we know God is powerful, but he's stinking now, okay? He's decomposing. And so Jesus went over, and he did it, and he raised his friend Lazarus. So it doesn't matter how long somebody's been dead, if they were cremated or whatever. The atoms have not escaped the atmosphere, the only things that escape our atmosphere are sent out deliberately, artificially, by the hand of humans, by the hands of man. Okay, that's the only way anything escapes our atmosphere. All the atoms from everybody that ever lived and died on planet Earth still exist here in the water and in the Earth. So the body, the resurrected body that is promised in Scripture is going to be superior. It's an imperishable body. Nothing can harm it. It can't die. So this is a great promise to look forward to. And it can happen fast. God can do this thing quickly. Jesus didn't take days to raise us from Lazarus. So four days, well, what's, you know, 4,000 years, matter of minutes, people can be resurrected. Okay, and all that while they've been sleeping in the dust, like it talks about in the book of Daniel so eloquently. You can go and sleep now in the dust with your fathers and, so they're alive. You see, to God, all are alive. We can't die. That's hugely good news, especially for somebody that's remorseful over having killed somebody. If they're repentant, regretful, uh, remorseful, uh, God knows it. And he wants to comfort you. He wants to strengthen you and comfort you in the knowledge that you didn't really kill anybody. You understand? That's impossible. It's thus saith the Lord. So the, the godly science suggests that's the reality that we should all behold and embrace and ponder, ruminate over these things. And it's good news, and we should spread that good news. And if we're remiss in doing that, we're missing out on a blessing. So this the paradox okay uh, that i was leading into is that on one side this is very good news okay that's why the bible is called the gospel which is translated good news the scriptures the holy scriptures uh, the word of god this is what it is 
Okay, that's it. So, I mean, you can have your Quran and you can have your holy books. You can have your, I forgot the term for the, the books the, the Jews use, but that's all well and fine. It's all good. But you see, the scriptures give us a taste of history and the nature and character of God for thousands of years. That After the fall of man, when we chose to go against God, he was upset, very upset. Okay, and remember, these stories could be similar all over the universe. In our galaxy, many stories just like ours with beings that look very much like us. But see, it's critical that God gave us his free will 